morning. Good morning, everybody online on this overcast Tuesday morning in Las Vegas. Welcome to the AIA School of Architecture lecture. I know there is a large number of participants coming to today's lecture and numbers are still going up, um, more people joining us. And there is a great energy and I want to welcome all participants, colleagues and students. Uh, we will have over 50 people watching uh, online and my name is Stefan Lehmann and I'm a professor of architecture based in Las Vegas. The AIA mini lecture series fall 2021 is a collaboration between the AIA Las Vegas, AIA Nevada and the UNLV School of Architecture. Thank you to the American Institute of Architects. There are two free public lectures and both are on Tuesday morning at 8.30 Pacific time and registration is through the AIA Las Vegas chapter website. The lectures are by Chelsea Drenick of Woodworks in San Francisco and she is with us today. Hi Chelsea. Hello. <laughs> and Billy Fairclaws of Kieran Timberlake Architects in Philadelphia on November 9th. If you have not yet registered for this one, please uh, do so soon. I'm thrilled that our lecture today is on the exciting new possibilities offered by innovative timber construction systems, an area where we have seen a technological revolution since the 1990s. Potentially timber construction using wood from sustainably managed forests will be a part of our response to deal with the existential threat of climate change. And the next step now is to scale up the projects. Before I introduce our speaker, Chelsea Drenick, I want to briefly mention the theme of the mini lecture series. The two presentations explore the question of applied research and how new innovations are integrated into practice and transform the way we practice architecture, the way we design and construct. A question that occupies architects around the world. How can we capture applied practice-based research findings and make them part of our project design. What is called research-informed design. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Chelsea Drenick and Woodworks. As most of you will know, Woodworks is a powerful resource for everything timber and is involved in creating design tools, research publications, webinars, and educational programs. The mission of Woodworks is to make it easier for project teams to design, engineer, construct successful wood buildings in the US by providing free project support, a nationwide education program and a range of published resources available online. More information at www.woodworks.org. The theme of mass engineer timber is very exciting and there have been a huge amount of publications. Timber in the city, solid wood case studies, Building with Timber for the Future, just to name a few. The title of Chelsea Drenick's talk is Applied Research Advances in Engineered Timber Construction. Chelsea is a licensed structural engineer in the state of California. She received her Bachelor in Science in Engineering from Harvey Mudd College and a Master Degree in Civil Engineering from Stanford University. As a Regional Director for Woodworks, she helps project teams achieve successful wood buildings in California, Nevada, and Utah. Prior to joining Woodworks, Chelsea spent nine years in structural design consulting. Her experience is in a variety of sectors, including residential higher education, retrofit of existing and historic structures. She is passionate about sustainability and the use of wood, of timber as a building material to reduce the embodied carbon emissions of structures. She will first give an overall introduction of the advances in engineered mass timber construction and then present selected projects that illustrate these innovations. We are honored to have Chelsea with us. I hope you will enjoy this lecture, which will be for 50 minutes, followed by 20 minutes Q&A. All participants are invited to send their questions via the chat box function, and we have already received a couple of questions up front. Please join me now in welcoming Woodworks. We are super happy to have you with us. Over to you, Chelsea. Thank you so much. Um, let me share my screen. And all right, success. <laughs> um, all right, well, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming and having me here today. 
I'm Chelsea Drenick, uh, the Regional Director for Northern California, Nevada, and Utah. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, mass timber products, performance, and design. Um, and as he said, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat, um, and we will get to as many as we can at the end. So before jumping into the content of the presentation, I want to say a few quick words about Woodworks for those who may not know about us. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping project teams design and construct wood buildings. So I do a lot of presentations like this, uh, but our main focus is that we provide free assistance to architects, engineers, and others in the building industry. So um, ask me your questions, bring me your challenges. If I don't know the answer, I can, I'm sure I can find someone who uh, knows. Uh, so as the regional director in your area, uh, I'm your main point of contact for project assistance. Uh, I am located in San Francisco and I'm really hoping uh, to make it out to Nevada soon uh, now that uh, travel is opening up. But um, please reach out. Uh, I'm available by phone, email uh, to answer any questions. I've been feeling a lot of questions about mass timber. So the reason we can provide free assistance is because of our funders. Our main funders are the Softwood Lumber Board, the US Department of Agriculture and Forestry Innovation Investment. We also have a number of funders that are manufacturers, both light frame and mass timber. So we get to talk to them about their products, learn um, from them what they're working on, and we can also connect you with them if you are interested. So because we're talking about mass timber today, I wanted to share with you the Woodworks Innovation Network. Our project assistance is confidential, but we wanted something that would allow folks to showcase their projects and connect with other experienced professionals. So uh, go to woodworksinnovationnetwork.org uh, and you can see exciting mass timber projects all around the country. Uh, we're also tracking projects, uh, mass timber projects we know about in design and construction, and there are over a thousand of them in design and construction here in the United States. Uh, since we began tracking in 2013. So mass timber really is here uh, and it is here to stay. So we have a number of resources on our website, uh, case studies, design resources, uh, tested assemblies. Uh, feel free to take a look there. If you're looking for something, let me know. Um, we also have national events. So every month we have a free webinar. Uh, upcoming, there's one on mass timber and MEP. Uh, and then we also have uh, larger events, symposiums. There's one upcoming in uh, November and we do workshops as well. So check out our website to find out more. So this is an AIA accredited class. If you provided your AIA number on uh, registration, uh, we will submit those uh, to AIA, AIA to get credit. I will also send a certificate of completion via email as well. Uh, so here's the course description um, and the learning objectives that are required by AIA. Um, but I'd like to get to our agenda today, the what, why, and how of mass timber. So let's talk about the what. First, understanding what mass timber is, uh, typical products, and then some case study examples here. All right, so mass timber construction. I like to think of the delineation between mass timber and heavy timber. So heavy timber, we're thinking of a solid wood member, a solid eight by eight single piece of wood for a column, a 10 by 14 solid wood beam. Mass timber can have these same sizes, but it's made up of a number of smaller components. Individual wood members that are laminated together, either using adhesives, nails, screws, or another type of mechanical fastening. So here's a visual comparison I like a lot. We have heavy timber on the left, mass timber on the right. One of the old adages with heavy timber, this historic method of construction was large column, large tree, meaning that every single large cross section of wood had to come from a single tree, which can be hard to source. So if you have to have that 12 by 12 column, you have to have a tree that was large enough for that. Whereas on the right with mass timber, we can still have that 12 by 12 column, but instead of coming from one singular log, we can fabricate that from smaller pieces. So we can use commodity lumber products, perhaps even lower grade products using smaller diameter trees to still produce similar size elements, columns, beams, and panels. So let's take a look um, at the main framing types that we typically see here in a mass timber building. So the first one's post and beam, probably the most common type of mass timber construction. Uh, usually the posts and beams are glue lamb, but they could be solid sawn, PSL, LVL, or another type of engineered wood product. And here they are supporting a mass timber panel floor. 
Here we're using mass timber as a two-way span system, point supported, similar to what you'd see with flat plate concrete construction. Note looking down the photo in the building, uh, you see no beams, only columns and flat plate CLT. So one thing to note is there is a different grid in each direction. So it's nine by 13. Um, and I'll talk about that more in a moment, uh, why that is with CLT. Also notice that the grid's pretty tightly spaced. Uh, so we're seeing this more in residential uh, compared to the previous one that had posted beam, we're seeing more in office spaces. More common in Europe, this is honeycomb or a house of cards style of construction where both the vertical bearing systems, the walls and the horizontal decks are all mass timber. The thing to note too, is we don't have to do an entire mass timber building. For multifamily, we've seen CLT floors with prefabricated panelized light frame walls used very successfully. So but we're replacing the floor system that was, would typically be TGI joists or solid sound joists with CLT panels spanning to wood bearing walls. Uh, we are limited to height uh, to five stories for multifamily with wood frame walls, uh, type three construction. And I'll talk about construction types uh, in a bit. Also seen it used with steel, you know, maybe this is the best fit for your project, finding it best to combine steel framing with CLT. We've seen this a lot for office projects, a little more flexibility with penetrations, as you can see in the photo. Uh, drop beams shown here uh, are typically easiest for install. There are, are other options as well. All right, so of those framing styles, we saw a lot of different products. So let's take a look uh, and dive a little deeper into those. Uh, so I'm going to introduce these here, the products, and then we're going to talk about each uh, or a few of them uh, in depth a little more. So glue lamb timber, glue lamb, uh, typically are beams and columns shown on the far left. Cross laminated timber, CLT. Uh, CLT right now is uh, really um, kind of a buzzword, and I think mass timber and CLT are kind of used interchangeably sometimes. Uh, you know, when we say a CLT building, but it, it is a specific product. Uh, here it's shown with solid sawn laminations in the center. This is most typically known. Um, it is also now available with structural composite lumber laminations uh, as shown on the right. Basically a really big piece of plywood. Um, lesser known, but also uh, utilized often, dowel laminated timber, DLT, nail laminated timber, NLT, and glue laminated timber, GLT. All of these products, all the laminations are running in the same direction, a single span direction. It's just a difference in how these laminations are mechanically fastened together, dowels, nails, or glue. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about dowel laminated and nail laminated. Um, not gonna talk more about glue laminated timber panels. Um, they are an option that we've seen used, um, not as frequently as CLT. Uh, it's basically a glue lamb beam on its side. So speaking of glue lamb beams, um, here uh, is shown um, basically two buys glued together, uh, pressed and then planed down. I think it's been used in light frame for, or it's been used in construction for a hundred years or so. Glue lamb beams have been around for a while. Um, they come in a variety of grades, uh, you know, in light frame construction in a house, you can use them for long spans, hide them in a wall, then we're using an industrial grade. Um, if they're exposed, it's a higher architectural grade, uh, and they're commonly used for the posts and beams. Now starting to dive into these horizontal surfaces, the floors and roofs on these mass timber panels or mass timber buildings. The first item here, uh, the first product we'll look at is nail laminated timber, NLT. So nail laminated timber uh, are made up very simply of two bys, usually two by four, two by six, two by eight oriented on their narrow face, so their strong axis is now in the downward direction. We just have multiple laminations laid up side by side. Each lamination is nailed to the previous. Uh, so it's primarily used in horizontal applications, floors, roofs, um, and we're always gonna be adding plywood to one face to have in-plane shear capacity. So it can be used as a structural diaphragm. One thing to consider with NLT, since all the grain is running in the same direction, is they're swelling and shrinking while the moisture content varies during construction. So that's why we use an expansion joint or simply leave out a lamination every panel, which is every eight to 10 feet, uh, will allow that movement to occur without causing damage, damages to the finishes. So that's what's shown here on the photo on the right, um, that gap uh, to allow for shrinking and swelling during construction. 
This allows the moisture content to reach an equilibrium, and once the building's closed, the gap can be filled. So this is different than CLT, which I'll talk about in a moment. So it's something that's been recognized in the IBC for a long time. Uh, the IBC calls it mechanically laminated decking. It's the same thing as NLT. Uh, and it's permitted anywhere that combustible materials and heavy timber are allowed. So construction types three, four, and five. Uh, if you're interested in nail laminated timber, there is a free nail laminated timber design guide uh, on thinkwood.com. It also includes example specifications. So super helpful if you're starting a new project. Um, this is a great place to go if you're interested in using this on a project. NLT panels are interesting because there's something that can be prefabricated offsite and just shipped to the construction site, or it can be built on site. Usually not, they're not built lamination by lamination um, in place, but they could be as shown in the photo on the left. So this is really different than other mass timber products that I'm gonna talk about today. All the other products are always prefabricated. And I think NLT was more popular when the mass timber supply chain was less mature, but now there are a number of CLT manufacturers across the country, across uh, North America, and also in Europe that can supply here. So for larger projects, it's more cost-effective to use a prefabricated panel. However, I have actually heard a lot of recent interest in NLT for single family homes, or maybe there's a feature room, you know, that you wanna use NLT in. Um, and so it makes more sense to have the contractor fabricated on site. So um, this is a great way to dip your toe into mass timber um, is to use NLT um, on a project. Also, if it's something where it's prefabricated offsite, usually it makes sense to also apply the sheathing there. Um, I mentioned we're always gonna be adding plywood or uh, OSB uh, so we can have in-plane shear capacity. So installing in the shop uh, where it's being prefabricated makes a lot of sense that once it gets to site, all you have to do is drop the panels in place. Um, so if it's prefabricated um, offsite, we're gonna leave that plywood shy of the edge so we can add this plywood spline that um, provides the continuity across the panels. Notice here, um, these taping of the joints, uh, it's important if there's expected weather on site as shown here with the rain, um, because CLT uh, mass timber is going to be our finish, uh, you wanna protect it. So you don't want that water staining uh, during, during construction. Uh, this is T3 in Minneapolis, a speculative office building. Heinz, the developer, is making a splash in the marketplace with mass timber buildings. So T3 used post and beam glue lamp system uh, with NLT floor. Uh, they had two by eight NLT spanning about 20 feet uh, to beams. The beams are spanning about 25 feet to columns. So here the NLT was exposed from underneath and they had a layer of OSB on top uh, with an acoustical mat and then concrete topping. Uh, here's a finished photo of the inside. They had so much success with this project, they're building it other places as well. T3 Atlanta is complete. T3 Denver is in design. T3 is in the works in Canada as well. T3 stands for Timber Technology and Transit. And they've already sold this building, T3 Minneapolis, and had a very good return on investment. All right, another system, another option here uh, is Dowell Laminated Timber, DLT. So it's very similar to NLT in terms of the members that make up a DLT panel. Uh, two by vertically oriented members. Uh, the difference is instead of nailing each lamination to the adjacent one, wooden dowels, hardwood dowels are driven through the panels. Are there, although there are some nuances here, um, it's not prescriptively in uh, the IBC uh, like NLT is. Uh, I think it's interesting how these are mechanically fastened together. Uh, the moisture content of the laminations is higher than when they, the wooden dowels that are driven in. So once the dowels are inserted, they expand as the moisture contents equilibrate. And that's how it mechanically locks the panels together. So they're all wood, um, no, no adhesive, uh, no nails. Uh, StructureCraft is currently the only dedicated North American DLT manufacturer. Uh, and they can run these panels through a CNC machine since it's all wood. Um, and they can create a lot of uh, interesting profiles, uh, acoustic profiles and the like as shown here. This was the first DLT office building in the US, uh, also the first mass timber building in Iowa, built and supplied by StructureCraft. Uh, four stories, over 65,000 square feet. Uh, structural grid system is 20 by 25 feet with two by eight DLT. 
Notice that is the same grid spacing as T3 Minneapolis. So there are um, efficiencies in certain grids and we actually have an article on that on our website. Um, and I'll talk about a, a bunch of links throughout this presentation um, and I will uh, send them um, to you afterwards as well. So you can also see the expansion sh joints shown here between the panels and the photo that I mentioned are required when we are using these products that have laminations all in the same direction. So that is important um, for the shrinking and swelling due to moisture content variations. Another option here, tongue and groove decking, kind of borderline mass timber, heavy timber, um, but we'll look at it because it has been used in some modern mass timber buildings, usually two by three by four by, uh, tongue and groove on their narrow face. So it can be used um, as a diaphragm itself, uh, or you can add a layer of plywood if you need a higher capacity uh, diaphragm. So here's a California example of a project that was uh, recently constructed using uh, glue laminated timber columns and beams and a TNG uh, tongue and groove floor, three by Douglas fir, four story office building called Ice Block in Sacramento. It's also part of our business case study uh, that we recently released, looking at two speculative office buildings. These case studies provide qualitative and quantitative information uh, looking at value and financial performance of these buildings. So um, that is a great new resource we have on our website, free download as well. Uh, three stories of office over a one-story retail podium, a uh, very cool project. Uh, it's an interesting project because they there was an existing heavy timber, uh, his, uh, old heavy, heavy timber building on this site that they were going to renovate, and it burnt down right before they started renovation. So the developer really wanted to get the same look and feel of the building that they lost, and so that's why they use mass timber. All right, closing out a product list with a product everyone has heard the most about, uh, CLT. Uh, so this is showing uh, CLT with solid sawn laminations, as I mentioned, and there is also now newly available CLT with structural composite lumber laminations. Uh, this is from Frere's Lumber up in Oregon. Uh, they're calling this product Mass Plywood Panel MPP. Uh, the cool thing about it is it's, you know, basically a giant piece of plywood. Um, I don't remember the exact dimensions. It's like 10 feet by 40 or so feet. Um, and varying thicknesses, I think up to 24 inches thick. Um, and they also can cut it into beams and columns as well. So very versatile product. Here's a, a project example here in the Bay Area near me uh, using that product uh, with structural composite lumber laminations. Um, it's a hybrid with light frame walls, MPP floor and roof plates. Uh, great project, a uh, very tight urban site, no room for staging at all. As you can see here, um, they lifted the panels directly from the truck into place. Uh, 19 MPP, each floor longest is 45 feet. Uh, originally, this was designed with all light frame, uh, TGI Joyce. Uh, the schedule is 14 months. With these panels, it was cut down to a 10 month window. So some great uh, savings there. All right, so back to our typical CLT with solid sawn laminations. Uh, CLT is formed in multiple layers, uh, two by side by side. We lay those down, put a screen of adhesive down, and the next layer is crossed. So 90 degrees rotated to the original, and then so on and so forth uh, until you get to the number of plies that you have for your design. So there's usually an odd number of plies, three, five, seven. The reason for that is because those outer plies are running the long direction and are considered the major or strength axis. The opposite direction is the minor or weak axis. So unlike NLT or DLT, there is strength in two directions. So we can have that flat floor plate construction spanning to uh, post um, point supported two-way span. One direction will always have a longer span than the other. This is showing a CLT press at manufacturer DR Johnson's facility. Each manufacturer has a different size press, so slightly different size panels. They use different species, so different strength design. With mass timber, it's important to involve a manufacturer early on in the design process so we can settle on these parameters. Or if you're not involving manufacturer early on, to make sure you're aware of the range um, and designing for um, uh, the lowest common denominator. So here I have a video um, showing um, 
the making, the manufacturing of a panel. So first we start with uh, commodity lumber, two buys. First thing we're gonna do is finger joint them end on end so we can have these longer panels. Panel lengths range from 40 to 60 feet long. So now we have those longer two buys, they will be cut down to size. Um, each panel is for a specific location on a specific project. Um, they will cut holes for mechanical electrical plumbing. Uh, there's that first layer of adhesive and then our second ply cross dimension. There's a hole in the diaphragm there. And then we have our third ply. Then it will go through the planer. We have our three ply panel. So CLT is a prefabricated system. It's not like what I said with NLT, maybe it's prefabricated, maybe it's made on site. All CLT is prefabricated. I'm not gonna go to our local lumber yard and say I need eight sheets of CLT. It's done for a specific project where you have a specific panel size. You have those openings cut in place. Everything is done in a shop in the factory. Tolerances are very tight, 16th to eighth of an inch for a total project. Everything is third party inspected in the factory as well. So some project examples, uh, this office building in Portland, Oregon, Albina Yard, a four-story CLT and glue lamb frame structure. Uh, mass timber can be used in quite a range of buildings. Here on the smaller end, uh, T3 we looked at earlier was over 200,000 square feet. So unlike NLT and DLT, CLT is dimensionally stable due to the cross laminations. So no gaps between the panels are required for swelling and shrinking. Um, so here's a project here in San Francisco. Um, it's, I believe, recently completed. Uh, three stories of mass timber over one story podium. Uh, this is type four construction. Uh, I've heard a bunch from the developer that one of the reasons this project uh, financially worked out was it was on a poor soil site. So they took a concrete building and a mass timber building uh, pretty far through design. Um, but the concrete building is significantly heavier. So they needed much more, um, many more piles, a uh, deep foundation compared to going with a lighter weight mass timber. Uh, another question that comes up often is, is CLT in the building code? And the answer is yes. It arrived in the building code in the 2015 IBC. It's defined in chapter two as a structural wood product. It's referenced in chapter 23 as an acceptable building material when manufactured according to this PRG 320 standard. Um, so that's important to know, uh, PRG 320. Um, and there are a number of manufacturers uh, across North America and a few in Europe that um, are certified for this standard. Um, and so it is loud per the code. Uh, I wanna mention one of our great new resources uh, when starting a mass timber project we wanted to make it easier for designers um, to uh, start their first project. So we put this together. Um, it helps with everything from grid layout, efficient grid design. Um, there are pages of uh, detailing examples that talk about cost as well as fire. Uh, case studies, we have acoustics, uh, both um, acoustics white paper and uh, tested assemblies, fire design and more. So this is free download um, from Thinkwood website. All right, so that's the what. Now let's look at the why. Why are we seeing this increased use, uh, this popularity of mass timber as a building material? Well, in 2019, we were at a global population of 7.7 .7 billion people. This is expected to rise to almost 10 billion in 2050. Where do we house everyone? Where will they work? How will climate change impact where people can live and work? So we need more buildings. We need more housing, but buildings generate nearly 40% of annual global greenhouse gas emissions, 40%. That's the yellow pieces of this pie here. 28% is building operations. So heating and cooling of a building, 11% is embodied carbon emissions. And that's when a building is built, how much CO2 is released due to its materials and construction. So let's look at this embodied carbon and operational carbon a little more closely. Operational carbon is a bigger portion of building emissions. For this example, 75%, uh, but in carbon, embodied carbon is an upfront cost. 
It takes 17 years for operational carbons to surpass embodied carbons. So we can have a real impact by reducing them in the short term. So these percentages do vary from building to building. And this example is a traditional non-wood building. I think the building industry is focused a lot on these operational carbons, which is great. We need to reduce them. And now we're looking more and more at embodied carbons. How can we reduce those? Operational energy is only improving, greener grids, more efficient heating and cooling. Embodied, embodied energy is not insignificant and it doesn't have to be a necessary evil of building a new building. So one thing that can help with that is wood. Wood is 49% carbon by mass or weight. In other words, approximately 50% of this wood is carbon. Carbon that was in our atmosphere contributing to global warming and is now physically converted into a solid form of wood and put into the building. Whole building life cycle assessments typically show wood buildings as a way to reduce the embodied carbon footprint of a structure. Uh, we recently re reduced a life cycle assessment um, on Plat 15, a mass timber office building in Denver. Uh, and the study looks at environmental impacts and cost of the structure. And I'll send you a link to that after the presentation as well. All right, so let's talk about forests. That's where these, that's where our wood comes from, right? It comes from a tree. Well, I really like this image from the US Department of Agriculture, and they have a number of great graphics to explain forestry, wood products, and carbon. Life cycle of wood begins with the growth of trees in a forest. So carbon flows into the forest ecosystem as the tree grows. Carbon is stored for a tree in a tree for the life of the tree. Left to natural processes, the tree will die and decay, releasing carbon back into the atmosphere. Instead, Carbon can continue to be stored by using that solid material in buildings and building products. So, so throughout the life of a wood building, it's storing, acting as a carbon sink, storing that carbon dioxide. So this is a cycle here. So the first one I mentioned, the natural tree process is this inner ring. And then we look at this outer ring where we can store that carbon for a longer term in wood buildings. One thing to note though, it's only sustainable if the forest is sustainable if the forest remains a forest after the tree was harvested. In North America, the forests have been very well maintained and very stable over the last 100 years. And there are a number of regulations um, on a national, federal level, as well state by state. Uh, and studies have actually shown that use of forest for wood products actually increases the tree number of trees in a forest. You know, if there's demand for wood products, you want that forest to remain a forest. Whereas if there's demand for agriculture, you might wanna turn it into something else. So here's a graph that shows this. Um, the forest land uh, in the United States uh, and USDA has uh, annual reports uh, looking at this. And we can see that the forest area has been stable for hundred years. So uh, we do not have to worry about deforestation uh, due to use of wood products here in the United States. Uh, and I do have a lot more resources on this. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, um, we can discuss it and uh, I can provide more. All right, so the other why, why mass timber? Biophilia. Biophilia is this innate human instinct to connect with nature. We feel good around wood. Studies have shown it. Looking at these renderings, you know, which one would you like in your house? Which would, one would you like to be your living room? Another driving factor for change, this why of mass timber is a labor shortage. It's existed for many years. A lot of it was driven by the recession in 08 and 09, and it never really recovered from that. Coupled with when we build in urban settings, labor tends to be very expensive in urban settings. So mass timber is a way to integrate offsite construction. Then our crew onsite can be smaller, creating more jobs offsite in a safer work environment. And this is also true of other prefabricated systems, like panelizing walls, panelizing floors, um, and I have other uh, materials on uh, modular and prefab as well. All right, so this next point is tied to the previous. Compressing construction schedules will reduce the requirements of labor, requiring less time of folks on site. Time is money. Mass timber helps with this. It requires a lot of coordination up front, but when it gets to site, it goes up like a set of Legos or an Ikea piece of furniture. It goes up very quickly. So this is a project a feasibility study uh, to compare a concrete construction schedule to a mass timber construction schedule for the same project, a 12-story tower study um, in Seattle, and there's a five-month saving on the construction schedule to use mass timber. You know, developers like to hear that. You know, they'll see the return on their investment that much sooner. Another benefit 
mass timber wood, it's the lightweightness. I mentioned this with Wanda Haro, um, and uh, particularly compared to concrete buildings, also steel buildings. Um, benefit in an area where there's poor soil sites, where we're having to install deep foundations. Also in a benefit in the area of seismic loading. You know, lighter weight means more efficient seismic system. Lighter weight also means smaller cranes, lighter tools on site, lots of benefits. All right, so that's the why, the market drivers for mass timber. Um, and so I went over construction efficiency speed. Uh, it's great for urban infill sites. Um, like I mentioned with project one earlier, this innovation aesthetic, the biophilia. Uh, these secondary drivers are sometimes primary drivers. I think carbon reductions are more important, more and more important. Um, and I'm on the SC 2050 committee, uh, structural engineers um, aiming for uh, zero embodied carbons uh, by 2050. You can go to sc2050.org to find out more. A lot of information there on embodied carbon. Uh, structural performance, lightweightness, um, sometimes a primary driver in poor soil sites. Um, so we have a great checklist um, on our website. Um, it's the design and cost optimization checklist. And on page three, uh, there is this benefits of mass timber um, matrix. I'm not here to say mass timber is right for every project, but if some of these, um, if some of these benefits ring true, uh, it's worth exploring. All right, so the what, the why, and the how. So with the last uh, bit of this presentation, we will go through construction types, where does mass timber fit, look at fire resistance, acoustics, MEP, uh, a little dabble in lateral framing connections, uh, construction, and then wrapping up with the future of mass timber going taller. All right, so let's talk about construction types. Starting out high level, IBC has five different construction types, one, two, three, four, and five. Each building must be classified as one of these. These uh, are specified for heights and areas. Um, you know, and the taller you go, uh, you're going to be pushed into types one and two. Um, so five main categories, all but four have subcategories or subtypes A and B, and they're really just a function of what level of fire protection do different parts of the structure have. So the way the code classifies construction type one and two uh, is that they constructed all with non-combustible materials. However, there are some exceptions for using mass timber in one and two, uh, and I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, but focusing in on type three, four, and five, mass timber doesn't have to be type four. Type four is known as the heavy timber construction type, but it does also fit in three and five. And that's because three and five allow any building material allowed per code. And that includes mass timber. Uh, type three does require exterior, exterior walls um, be non-combustible or fire retardant treated wood. Uh, so we're not gonna be using mass timber and exterior walls in type three. But in, in all the other types uh, and everywhere else in type three, four and five, we can be using mass timber. So you don't have to just jump to type four. Um, it's best to use the least restrictive building type for the height and uh, size of your structure. And we do have some co comparison charts that compare um, type three, uh, type three A to type four, uh, because we have very similar heights and areas allowed for the two, um, but different fire uh, requirements. All right, touching on uh, type one and two briefly, uh, there is a special provision, uh, a footnote in table 601 in the IBC that says you can use heavy timber, mass timber in the roof. Um, so here's a project example in Portland uh, where they used exposed heavy mass timber framing um, in the roof. All right, let's talk about fire resistance. Certainly a subject of much discussion and conversation. We're talking about exposing mass timber uh, throughout a building. People want to know how it's going to perform in the event of a fire. So I think it's good to remember that mass timber, heavy timber, it has an inherent fire resistance. That's fire resistance that enables it to protect essentially the inner portion of wood that's not burned or charred to retain its structural properties. Uh, this chart on the left and the image on the right is key to this. In the photo, there's a glue lamb beam on the left and a steel beam on the right. We know structural steel, when it's bare exposed to high temperatures in the event of fire, it starts to deform and warp and lose its structural properties fairly quickly. So this is showing after 30 minutes uh, when exposed to 1300 degree temperatures, the steel beam has lost 90% of its structural properties. After the same 30 minutes, the wood beam has only lost 25%. 
So we have this inherent fire resistance that allows us to expose wood. One thing to take away from this photo though is fire is bad. Steel melts, wood burns, concrete can explode. Fire is no materials friend. We have got to design for fire and our codes are written for that, but how we design for each material does differ. So wood, uh, as it burns, mass timber, heavy timber in particular, it burns at a rate that we can predict very accurately and it burns fairly slowly. As it burns, it's forming this char layer outside on the exposed surfaces. That char layer is insulating the inner wood, keeping it cold so it can retain its structural properties. So there's been a number of tests throughout the years um, and we know that that char rate uh, forms at approximately inch and a half per hour. So that's the sacrificial wood, extra wood fiber that we're adding to our um, beams, our members, panels um, in case of a fire. So you can see that here, um, the, the sacrificial wood that's lost, um, that is basically our fire protection. So the code path for calculating this uh, comes from the IBC section 722.1. Uh, where it says if you need to calculate the fire resistance of exposed wood, you go to the NDS chapter 16. So I think this is important to point out because NDS uh, is uh, something that engineers use all the time. I used it in my previous practice. Uh, I didn't know about this chapter, and I think a lot of engineers aren't familiar with it unless they've done mass timber before. Uh, so engineers aren't familiar with that chapter and neither are architects, but architects are specif specifying the fire resistance rating requirement. So this is a really a collaboration that's required where the architect's like, hey, this is the fire rating I need. And the engineer can go and figure out what size member is required given the loading and the fire rating, how much sacrificial wood, uh, what size do we need? And it's a fairly simple process. Um, as I said, it's about an inch and a half per hour approximately, but there are calculations that are required. Um, so there's calculated chart char approach. Uh, there are five other ways to establish a fire resistance rating. Um, and most common uh, that we know is a tested assembly. Um, so we have a list of these on our website, um, an inventory of tested assemblies. Um, I'll send you a link to that as well. All right, let's touch on acoustics. So acoustics, there are two um, ratings that we pay attention to, that's the sound transmission class, STC, measures how effectively an assembly isolates airborne sound and reduces the level that passes from one side to the other. Then we have structure-borne sound, which is our impact insulation class, evaluates how effectively an assembly blocks impact sound from passing through it. So we have code requirements for multifamily residential um, uh, hotels. Um, basically, we need a minimum of 50 for our walls, floors, ceilings, um, uh, SDC, and IIC. Really, there's not requirements for others like offices and assemblies, but typically owners, the clients will have some performance in mind. So this is a really good conversation to have, a value add to make sure the expectation of the client is met. Um, so mass timber, the lightweightness of CLT panels, it works for us for the structural design, construction, works against us for acoustics. We're not just going to have a bare panel. Um, and so another reason for that is it's also a softwood product. So that means if you roll a chair over it, if you walk over it, um, it's not very durable. It's not going to wear well. It's a very strong product. It's a soft product, though. So this is the most common assembly where we have the ceiling side exposed to the CLT. Then we'll have an Acoustimat product, um, and then we'll either have gypcrete or concrete. That could be your finished floor, um, and or you could have um, additional finishes on top of it. Um, so the nice thing about that system is that concrete can also help uh, with vibrations, um, but there are options without concrete. You know, whether it's for um, weight or uh, environmental concerns. There are a number of uh, new uh, proprietary acoustic products. So we have an inventory list of acoustically tested assemblies as well on our website. Another question that comes up a lot is, okay, we've had this nice exposed wood. What do we do with MEP, this mechanical electrical plumbing? One thing we can do is just leave it exposed. Uh, industrial look here. 
Um, here's a, there's a couple options though. Here on the left, uh, we have this corridor approach where this end row of columns is pretty tight to this core concrete wall. So this beam here um, is pretty shallow. So we can push that uh, MEP up into that space uh, and we don't have to lose much on our floor to floor heights. Raised access floor, we've seen this done a few times with some modern mass timber buildings. Uh, anywhere from a two inch plenum to 18 inches to uh, fit our HVAC in there. Uh, there's some great creative solutions as well. Uh, we've seen slotted uh, ceiling panels on many projects actually. And that's basically we're leaving like a, a foot or two gap here um, where we have plywood spanning across it. Uh, and then you can run all your sprinkler lines, uh, HVAC through here and then close it up. Here's another cool thing where they staggered the CLT panels. So we have this uh, ceiling panel as well as this floor, um, floor access for conduit. And this one on the right, the rendering on the right, the final product came out like this. So uh, can really create beautiful spaces and hide the MEP away and still expose the mass timber. So just requires a little bit more creativity. Um, and actually we have a webinar coming up next week on this, um, which I am really excited about. All right, another option here, uh, especially if we have a gypcrete concrete topping um, to put some conduit in it. Um, problem here, it's not very flexible, especially for an office building where we're gonna have uh, tenant improvements, um, but a good solution uh, that's been used commonly. Touching on lateral framing systems. So, uh, code process turned slowly. We're working on getting CLT shear walls into the code, not quite there yet. Uh, so most designs are using other lateral solutions for uh, seismic. Uh, so for office buildings, for taller buildings, uh, we'll typically be sealing, seeing steel or concrete. Something to think about with these um, is tolerance difference. Uh, I mentioned that uh, mass timber has very tight tolerances, steel and concrete not so much. So need to make sure there's flexibility in the detailing of these connections, uh, leave space for um, that tolerance. Also different subcontractors, you know, looking at the steel brace frame here, um, we have to think about, you know, when is the steel erector on site? When is the mass timber erector on site? Who's doing what? A lot of considerations there. Uh, for shorter residential projects, we've seen um, light frame wood shear walls used very effectively. So, we're only seeing that in five stories or less, uh, type three, type uh, type three construction typically. Um, so yeah, different options here uh, to consider until we get CLT shear walls. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about where we are on that code process, I can provide information on that as well. So flipping through these lateral framing system options, uh, here's a concrete core, this is T3. Uh, seen, uses, seen this used uh, effectively on a lot of projects. Um, Ascent in Milwaukee, the 25-story mass timber building, uh, also use concrete cores. And so they'll, they'll typically start the concrete cores, go up much faster or, or go up slower than the mass timber. Um, so you need to make sure those are ahead um, of the mass timber. Uh, Steel moment frames commonly used as well. You can hide those in the exterior glazing facade system. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of brace frames. I think all the office buildings um, going up in the Bay Area are using buckling or strain brace frames. So that is uh, a nice option as well. Uh, you know, it goes up similar to mass timber in terms of uh, installation speed. So a lot of questions come up on panel to panel connection. A few ways to do it most commonly is this plywood splice or spline detail. Uh, manufacturer can just leave out a small section of each CLT panel uh, or remove a portion of it. And then uh, when you get to site, you're gonna put this plywood spline down, screw or nail it down. So this is in the new uh, structural design provisions for wind seismic um, that will be uh, adopted with the 2021 IBC. Touching on connections, uh, don't wanna to go too in depth into it, uh, but connections are typically consisting of small diameter self-tapping screws. You see a lot of these on projects. I was on a project site recently that had 60 different self-tapping screws, different lengths, diameters, a lot of different ones. They should have maybe minimized that a little more, but this is really a new vocabulary of connections, particularly on these larger projects. 
uh, lots of different shapes and sizes for self-tapping screws, and also an ever-improving market of tools to install these longer fasteners easier and more accurately. Uh, and there's a wide range of connections available. Um, and I mentioned that post and beam is commonly used. And here's three different ways to accomplish post and beam. Uh, three different price points, three different type of connections, three different installation processes. Uh, on the left, we have a steel bearing plate, probably designed by the structural engineer, fabricated by a steel fabricator. The center, we have proprietary um, connectors um, for this connection. And then on the right, we don't even have any connectors. You know, this this beam slots into the column. One thing you also have to think about this with this is shrinkage. It accumulates floor to floor. Shrinkage. These beams will shrink the width and the height. They won't sh shrink the end on end. And same with columns. The columns won't shrink end on end. So what you want to do is figure out how to bypass uh, the beam shrinkage. Um, and so setting that panel directly on a column will bypass the shrinkage of the beam so it won't accumulate. So considering uh, shrinkage, consider fire, there's a lot of different things that go into these connections. They're exposed. How can we make them beautiful? So it, to aid in this design effort, uh, we released this index of mass timber connections. Uh, great resource I can send to you and it's also linked um, in our mass timber design manual. All right, touching briefly on sourcing, uh, construction, and cost. Uh, mass timber is really unique in the sense that it requires the designer to have a strong connection or awareness of the manufacturer due to the fact that CLT is not standardized. It's not a commodity product. It's made up of commodity product, but itself is not a commodity product. So it's good to select a manufacturer early on so you can commit to grid size, panel capacity, panel size, um, and the manufacturer is also here to help. You know, if this is your first project, they can really help. They can help with this design assist with efficiency and detailing. Um, and so it's kind of, it, it feels weird to people to commit to a manufacturer that early on, but it really is the best approach. Um, however, we have seen projects, you know, public projects where, you know, they need to be um, bid um, on the drawing. So that is possible, but really using, the manufacturers as a resource uh, is the best way to have a successful project. Uh, mass timber manufacturers also provide uh, different things. You know, some can provide design, structural design, stamp the drawings, others prefer not to or can't. Some will uh, actually do the install, like Structure Craft does install as well. Uh, some prefer just to provide you the product. So, uh, figuring out what manufacturer is the best fit for your project uh, is a good start as well. We also have a new uh, construction management program that I wanted to mention. Uh, Woodworks has focused uh, our assistance for a long time on architectural architects and engineers, and now we're adding more contact, content for contractors and developers. So uh, we're currently providing mock-ups to carpenter training centers around the country. Uh, our newest addition is going to be uh, near Anaheim in California, so not too far away from Vegas. Um, so that will be available next year. Any uh, union carpenter can go get training uh, and certified for uh, mass timber installation. So costs, um, costs are tricky. I get a lot of calls asking me how much does CLT cost, and I can't give an answer because it's not a one-size-fits-all. Wide, uh, wide array um, of costs based on size of project, location, what type of spans are you looking for? How thick is it? What finish level? Really talking to the manufacturers of these mass timber systems is the best source of pricing. Um, and it really depends on how busy they are. You know, can't, how big of a project is it? Can they slot you into their schedule? So um, all the manufacturers are super friendly, uh, super great to talk to, and can give you a really quick, rough estimate of pricing if you give them a call. All right, so the last thing here, where is mass timber going? Uh, futures looking up, going taller. So as I mentioned, uh, before these new code provisions that are in the 2021 IBC, we're limited to six stories for business, uh, so office buildings, and five stories residential with wood, uh, limited to 85 feet. Cool thing is we can still go pretty tall with that. Like T3 Minneapolis um, was six stories of wood. You can still get to seven stories because we can put it 
on a podium, you can have mezzanine. There's a lot of options here um, to get a significant size building with those code limits. But we wanted to go taller. You know, Europe started the tall wood movement and to catch up, a tall wood ad hoc committee was created to explore it here in the States and to push forward new code provisions. So five full-scale mass timber tests uh, in a multi-story apartment building were conducted at a lab in uh, the summer of 2017. And the key to these tests that they wanted to prove was that they could get burnout of the fire without collapse. So I talked about char before, how it protects the integrity of the wood. That's what these tests prove. You know, they set these contents on fire, this full apartment building. The fire started, um, it, um, all the contents burned, and the fire put itself out even without sprinklers. So the tests were a success, um, and they prov proposed three new construction types that fit here under the type four construction type. So the previous type four, four heavy timber is now type four HT. They didn't really want to touch that but we now have type four A, B, and C. What does that look like? Um, type four A, we can go up to 18 stories. Type four B, we can go up to 12 stories. Type four C, nine stories. Difference between these is the amount of mass timber that can be exposed. So type four A, you unfortunately can't expose any of the mass timber. Uh, we have to have non-combustible protection on all surfaces. Type four B, we can expose 20% of the ceiling. Uh, and type 4C, it can all be exposed. So uh, some uh, states' jurisdictions have adopted these provisions early, and they are uh, their projects in design and construction uh, around the country, which is very exciting. So with that, I would like to open up to questions. Thank you, Chelsea. This was great. Uh, let me get back at my video. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chelsea. You did a wonderful job in laying out all the exciting possibilities of timber construction. And we have a couple of questions that have been great through the chat. And uh, um, so some questions we have received. The first one is for architecture practices to get into innovative mass timber construction, a significant amount of time must first be invested in research for each project. But the client is often not willing to pay for the research. Can you share some ideas what, what worked for practices to get more quickly involved and participate in this new way to build? Yeah, definitely. So that, that's definitely true. Um, any new material, new type, there is some investment required. Um, manufacturers, like working with an experienced team, other people who have mass timber experience really helps. Um, involving the manufacturer, as I mentioned, in a design assist role uh, is really helpful. Um, and also using the resources that are out there. You know, Woodworks has created a lot of resources to try to assist with this. In turn, like we have the sample detailing, we have all these tested assemblies. Um, really start from build on what is already available um, is the most successful way to do it. Okay. Um, another question is about a supply chain. Um, and it's uh, looking at projects that are located far away from the manufacturing of the panels. So the question is, what about the carbon emitted from transporting the panels from the manufacturing plant to the construction site, for instance, on a truck or by train is probably better, but on a truck most of the time. Um, how do you calculate that? Is it, is it calculated uh, or is it always forgotten? You know, it, because it could be quite significant. We see, for instance, now projects, let's say in the Middle East, and there's no manufacturer of panels. Yet. Yeah, and yeah. They, their panels from Europe, the US, or from Australia through the Suez Canal <laughs> on a ship <laughs> or some way, you know, uh, and, and it could be a diesel uh, motor driving the, the ship or the truck, tracking it uh, from Oregon down to Nevada. What happens with all those emissions? Yes, that's a good question. So with whole building life cycle assessments, which are being done more and more, uh, that is accounted for, that transportation cost. Um, and there are different ways to do it, as you mentioned, and they have different costs. So trucking is probably worst. Um, barges are more efficient. Uh, trains, like the project here um, in San Francisco, they actually put on a train from Canada, the CLT panels. So um, that is pretty cool. And I think also as this becomes more and more popular, we will see more and more manufacturers. We're already seeing that. Um, California is working really hard to 
bring manufacturing to the state so we can have more of that local resource. So I think that's hopefully the next uh, step here. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, good, good answer. Uh, there's quite a concern about what happens to the forests. And you explained this and you um, you said uh, you, you spoke about you had a couple of slides on that. But there is another question from Carlos. How do we guarantee that our afforestation efforts can meet the rate of deforestation when mass timber is widely adopted and becomes more and more fashionable also? Yeah, so I, I would say there's multiple pathways to forest sustainability. And it's a complicated topic, but we have we have third party certifications. So there, there are maps and there are um, widely available on the internet that show countries at risk of deforestation. And so if you're sourcing wood from one of those countries, you want a third party certification. You know, you want FSC, you want SFI. Here in the United States, um, there are regulations in place. Um, such that it's actually hard to source uh, certified wood from a lot of states. Like here in California, our state regulations are, are a giant book. You can't cut down a tree without approval in California. And so that ensures that we don't have de deforestation here. Almost to, I would say, a, a, you know, sometimes it's a problem because now it's hard to attract manufacturing to the state, you know, if it's hard to use our wood source. And so there's definitely a balance in terms of, you know, using our wood products so that it doesn't burn. So um, it's, it's a really complicated, interesting topic. And um, if you're interested in learning more, actually, my colleague, Mike, uh, is presenting on it tomorrow uh, for uh, Woodworks. So you can find that seminar on our website. Okay, we have two, three more questions, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I don't have anything next, so happy to stay on. <laughs> Fortino is writing a question. What kind of extra measures should be taken in tropical environments like Florida with high humidity? Yes, yes, that's a great question. Um, and it's all about enveloping um, and making sure that you don't trap water places. So um, what are your, and I, I don't, I'm not from Florida. We have a regional director in Florida. So if you have specific questions about Florida, um, I'd reach out to him, but uh, there are lots of resources on moisture management, uh, mitigation and uh, enveloping details. Um, and so I can send you that if you're interested. Yeah, and a question related to this, are there any tests for CLT mass timbers exposure to water, like to rain, but also to snow? On the you know are there long term tests looking at the impact? So CLT is uh, an interior product only, so um, we're not going to have it exposed um, to the elements. Uh, it has been used um, in eaves, and it can be used on the underside of things that don't have direct weather exposure. Um, and then we'll want to make sure we're using the proper coating. So coatings help uh, with sun exposure, UV, and water. Um, and one of our partners, uh, Sanson, has some great information on that. So uh, they do a lot of testing um, from the coding side. And then coatings is ongoing maintenance. So you want to be adding that coating every, I think, eight years if it's exterior. So yeah, UV exposure would be a big topic here in Nevada. Um, another question is about upscaling. Um, you know, we've been looking at one or individual building, single building here, single building in Montana, single building in Minneapolis and so on. But uh, we can have a bigger impact on curbing the climate change crisis by doing projects at an urban scale. So the question here is uh, about designing entire quarters and neighborhoods in timber construction. And we see now a series of projects under construction that create entire districts and neighborhoods in engineer timber construction. The first ones have been completed in Vienna and in Munich. So scaling up is already on the way, going beyond the single building. And uh, that could obviously be more and more interesting in terms of impact uh, to store CO2. Do you know anything about any large scale projects of wooden quarters in the US in the pipeline? And there was the sidewalk project in Toronto that was canceled, uh, unfortunately, which, which would have created an entire neighborhood in timber. Do, do you know any other large scale projects? Yeah, there are actually a few in the works here in the Bay Area, um, funded by tech companies. Uh, there's uh, Google's uh, downtown San Jose. Um, they're helping uh, fund a number of office buildings and residential buildings um, that are uh, currently in design. Uh, and if you Google downtown West, uh, you'll find that project. 
Uh, there's also Facebook's Willow Village, um, which has a housing component, community, uh, as well as office space uh, that's also here in the Bay Area. Uh, and they're all looking at using mass timber. And I think that goes along with, you know, this corporate environmental responsibility and uh, in ESG is kind of a buzzword right now, uh, environmental social governance, where companies are no longer just looked at their returns, but also how are they uh, contributing to the environment, you know, the social aspect, you know, what are they doing for the communities around them? And uh, jurisdictions are starting to require it as well, that, you know, if they're building uh, uh, office buildings, they need to be building residential. So it's really exciting uh, that's starting to happen here in the Bay Area. And I think we'll see it other places as well. Yeah, yeah very interesting uh, development. And uh, it's also called CSR, Corporate Sustainability Responsibility of, of, of uh, companies to do uh, good uh, for the environment. This was fantastic. Thank you, Chelsea. You helped us a lot. In my studio, we're working at the moment at uh, Timber High Rise, Tall Timber. Very exciting. We're looking at seven buildings between four to 15 stories uh, as a study. And so the students, very cool. many of the students online uh, watching, listening in, we're very uh, uh, excited to see uh, this lecture. So thank you very much, Chelsea. It's got, it has been recorded. It will be uh, sent to you the recording very soon. Uh, you you want to put it up on the uh, woodworks.org website. We will also put it up on AIA Las Vegas. Great. Uh, Chelsea told me earlier. So I say thank you very much from everybody. Uh, for your time and for a very interesting, comprehensive, complete lecture about all the benefits uh, that uh, CLT uh, provides, but also the challenges and the constraints you spoke about. Very open and honest, you know, it's not going to uh, be for every project and it's not going to fix all the problems, but there are clear reasons when we can use a lightweight mass timber construction and, 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 and benefit from those advantages. So thank you again, Chelsea. It's been Thanks for having me. Our best regards from Las Vegas to San Francisco. And I see my students in 15 minutes at the Zoom link we use for our seminar on research methods. And I say bye-bye to everybody else. And thank you to Kelly at AIA Las Vegas, who has been uh, hosting and moderating this talk. And all the best. Stay well. Thank Have you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.